Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research at the Institute of International and European Affairs. A very warm welcome to this uh, webinar at this unusual time at four o'clock on a, on a rainy afternoon in Dublin, where I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Mark Paul, who is the London correspondent for the Irish Times. And Mark is going to tell us a little bit about Labour's transition from opposition to government uh, by way of a UK politics end of year review. Obviously, throughout the year, we pay real interest at the Institute to the politics of our nearest neighbour. And it's always a nice thing towards the end of the year to try and reflect on what might have happened over the span of the year. And it has been a very exciting one. I'm not going to spoil any of it for you, but I'm sure Mark is going to tell us about the recent election and the various kind of implications of that Labour backing government for the first time since 2010. I'm going to very briefly introduce our speaker, take off the typical caveats, the typical bits of housekeeping, and then start a discussion with Paul with Mark, whose family name is Paul. Uh, Mark Paul has been the London correspondent and writer of the weekly London Letter for the Irish Times since January 2023. Before that, um, Mark was the author of the Backpage Caviar column in the Irish Times and also the Business Affairs correspondent. Mark joined the newspaper in 2013 from the Sunday Times, where he worked for almost a decade. Mark is currently a member of the Westminster Press Lobby, you lucky thing, primarily observing the political intrigue in the Houses of Parliament. But Mark also reports on events from Holyrood and the Senate in Edinburgh and Cardiff, and by the sounds of it, from all up and down the length and breadth of Britain. Typically, as, as always, the discussion today is on the record. You can participate as ever by putting a question in through the Q&A function on Zoom, and I encourage you to do so. And as ever, if you feel so moved, you can participate in the discussion using the X Twitter handle at IIEA. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Mark. And of course, in a moment, if you wouldn't mind addressing the topic of the discussion, Labour's transition from opposition to government. But before that, like we were just discussing earlier on today, I'm interested just to hear what, what it is like as you've recently enough arrived in London, what the transition has been like and, and what is it like journalising in London for you? Yeah, it's 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 a lot different from the job that I was doing in Dublin, Barry. I mean, I'm, I'm a member of the Westminster Press Lobby. I wasn't a member of um, of of Leinster House, and um, I didn't report on it all. I was I was I was more focused on economics and finance before I come over to London. But um, when I when I come over first, um, you have to apply to join the Westminster Press Lobby. Of course, there's about three or four hundred members of that. The the, the accredited members um, um, who 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 cover Parliament. Um, and it's a long and torturous process to get the past. And everybody talks about their past like this mythical, spiritual um, um, document that allows you into the back halls and the, the corridors of power in Westminster. It took about four or five months to get that. Um, um, a very, very heavy security process. And then once you get in, um, you really have amazing access in Westminster um, to the politicians. I mean, you could be walking along a corridor and there's Keir Starmer and, you know, um, um, I was about to say there's Boris Johnson, but of course he had his past taken away from him after Partygate. And that was one of the punishments that was levied upon him um, and by Sue Gray. Um, but um, so working day to day as a, as, as a lobby journalist in Westminster, um, there, are, there are two lobby briefings per day um, that you can attend one is in number nine downing street and um, usually at about half past 11 in the morning and then there's another one in the afternoon i think it's at about quarter to four um, and or you can tune into those remotely sometimes i go to these lobby briefings sometimes i don't because i think being an irish journalist in in, in london and um, you're, you're trying to do things you're, you're trying not to chase the same little bit of silver paper on the wind that all of the other lobby journalists in britain are chasing you're trying to look at things from a slightly different perspective and you're over here more trying to analyze and explain than you are trying to break hard news and um, so look i spend a lot of my time talking to mps and 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 and, and going to events in westminster but i have what i call um a 50 50 rule i call it um, um, I spend 50% of my time in, in or around Westminster and then I spend the other 50% outside of that and of that 50% I'll spend 50% of that in London doing other stuff outside of politics and 50% outside of London uh, uh, up and down the country doing other stuff so that's a kind of a little bit of a flavour of my of my life as a journalist here in, uh, in, in, in London and in Westminster. Very interesting Mark and, and I think a lot of people I'd include myself in this when I initially I lived in England for a long time and you can trick yourself into thinking that you you know England if you, if you know London and maybe one or two of the the kind of the university towns that I would have known and it was just through chance getting bit, bit, bits of work and maybe making a couple of friends from different places once you get out into the uh, into the kind of the, the wilds of England or indeed other parts of Britain it's a really uh, 
very enjoyable thing, but also quite different to life in London. And I think that's that's expressed politically as well as as well as in many other and many other ways. But I commend your fifty fifty rule. I think that's really cool. Just again, w- one more tiny thing before maybe if you want to talk about Labour's transition yes. position to opposition to government. But just what's the what's the typical kind of relationship or atmosphere between the different um correspondents and journalists in the in, in the Westminster group like is it it's interesting what you say you're all chasing the same bit of silver paper but in the end you're basically analyzing rather than trying to break hard news I've always kind of had the hunch but it's good to have you have you confirm it is it competitive uh, uh, are people collaborative what's the what's the kind of vibe typically like it's it's a uh, uh, cooperation I would say is probably is probably the thing I, like j- j- just to emphasize most of the other lobby journalists the the, the British based lobby journalists they are trying to break news all of the time and and, and of course we do try and break news in the Irish Times in in Britain uh, m- more so on on Anglo Irish affairs when I say analyze and explain um it's more about I, I suppose we're trying to differentiate what we're offering an Irish reader as, as as opposed to what they can already get in the Guardian and the Telegraph. But 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 as as for the journalists themselves in the lobby, I mean there are WhatsApp groups where people share transcripts. For example, all of the all of the broadcast members of the lobby, whenever they do an interview with a minister, they will share in advance transcripts with all of the print journalists, and um, because it helps to promote their own show. And um, there'll be embargoes put on those transcripts, and you'll pick lines out of it. And um, and people are there, there 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 is a lot of cooperation. Um, and there's a lot of collegiality. Um, um, you know, if you need something in the lobby, another lobby journalist will give it to you, whether it's a phone number. Um, 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 but also, um, uh, I think there's also a danger in that too sometimes. And it's one of the reasons why I have this 50-50 rule. I think if, you, if you're if you a foreign correspondent and you're based in London and you want to understand Britain as a whole, you can't just do Westminster politics because Westminster is a bubble inside London, which is another bubble. And as you already alluded to there's a whole nation outside of that and if you just stick too much to the lobby i think it's like i think do they call it a murmuration of of, of birds who all move in one in one That's fell the word swoop? a murmuration when the birds move as one yeah a, a, a murmuration and, and i think as a foreign correspondent you need to try and stay out of that murmuration the westminster murmuration because they'll all move as one uh, and and you need to try and find a different angle and a different way of uh of of, of, of approaching things Really, really interesting. It's it's always. I mean, I'm indulging myself here, but I always love kind of asking people about their craft. And when it's something I like, I follow British and Westminster politics as avidly as many people on the call. So just to get kind of a little bit of an insider's view is really cool. But the reason why we're here and why people have joined and why people will listen back after is because it's been an exciting year politically around the world. Right, 2024. Ireland booking the trend a little bit with the incumbents not been thrown from office last weekend. But that's the a discussion for another day. There was an election in the UK in July and other political events, which saw, amongst other things, Labour going from opposition to power. Why don't you share your thoughts with us, Mark, about about what happened there, what it might mean? Yeah, look, look, I'll try and keep my my, my presentation relatively brief and, and and leave over time for questions. But look, I suppose we'll start at today maybe and work backwards. And and it's a good day to have this discussion because the the Labour government under Keir Starmer has had its its I think its second reset um since it uh, since since it entered office today, um up in Pinewood Studios um in in Buckinghamshire today, Keir Starmer laid out um what he's called his plan for change, his his six milestones, which are effectively the six things that he wants to be judged on at the next election and these are different I suppose people might be confused there's already been the five missions and the six first steps and the three foundations I mean they really like their listicles in this in this Labour government um, but 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 he set out I think I, I think what Keir Starmer has done today effectively is to, is to effectively fire the starting gun on the next general election campaign and speaking to Labour people um, um, this week um, and that's definitely how they're seeing it um, they, they've, they've set out these these kind of and I made a note of them I wasn't actually at Pinewood today and um, I had stuff to do around London this morning but um, um, they set out these 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 six uh, uh, effectively targets or, or or they're a little bit like the sort of the, the, the five promises that Rishi Sunak made and um, they're based around um, the first one is about um, and making people feel better off uh, and, 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 and giving greater disposable income. The second one is to build 1.5 million homes in England. Um, I made a note of them here. The, the third one is about ending hospital backlogs. Fourth one is 13,000 additional officers. And after that, it's about uh, making kids school ready. And the last one was about clean power. I think what, what Keir Starmer is really trying to do is to is to hammer down metrics um, 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 that he can be judged on at the next election. And I was at a briefing 
earlier on this week with Jonathan Ashworth, who, of course, should have been in Keir Starmer's cabinet, but but he lost his seat um, um, in Leicester South in the election. And I was kind of asking him about this, about about the 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 wisdom of setting metrics, because when he set metrics like that as a politician, of course, you could be hammered by the electorate when you don't reach them. I think um, most famously, uh, Rishi Sunak's uh, metric about stopping the boats, um, um, I think was one of the things that, that really stopped him winning re-election. Um, um, if you set these targets, that you could be hit on them. And, and Jonathan Ashworth's reply was quite interesting. He said that the British electorate has lost trust in, uh, in, 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 in politics. And one of the ways of restoring trust is by speaking about targets and metrics and allowing yourself to be measured against them. So that's basically what they've been doing. But I suppose going back to, the, to, to our overall um, uh, reason for chatting today and, and, and looking at Labour's transition to power, um, the thing that has stuck out for me and that a lot of people that you speak to around Westminster um, 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 talk about is that this Labour government seemed to have been much more prepared for the election than it was for government. And I think that's the first principle or the first the, the first thing to talk about. Um, and, and, and I think that was a real um, that's, I think, one of Starmer's real flaws, one of the mistakes that he's made as a Labour leader. Um, I think it comes from what, what he described as his Ming Vei strategy, which is which is the strategy that he deployed before the election. And when if you can kind of imagine somebody carrying this precious Ming Vei um, um, to Downing Street, which is where he wanted to, to get there with it, um, he didn't want to drop it. He didn't want to take any risks. Um, 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 you don't juggle the vase. You don't try and do fancy tricks with it. You just try and walk as quickly and as 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 carefully as you can to Dennis carrying this phase. And as a result of that, um, 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 he didn't want to take any risks. And that means he didn't want to say too much about what they do in government. Um, so they employed Sue Gray, uh, a, a former civil servant, um, um, and they, you know, well before. I mean, she was she was in place um, and she was in place. March 2003, they, they, they appointed her. She took up her role in September 2003 and her role was to get Labour ready for government. Um, but he, I mean, even from from the Liz Trust days in late twenty twenty two, they had basically two years to prepare for government when it was obvious that they were going in, and it seems like they weren't prepared at all going in. And that they made, uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people on on on, on this call might, might might will already know Labour made quite a bad start in government. Um, um, in the first week or so, I mean, they they you know they had a flurry of announcements. They announced the start of GB Energy. They announced um, um you know new legislation to nationalise the railways. Um, and they started the National Wealth. Fund and I think on day one they scrapped Rishi Sunak's Rwanda plan, but they seemed unprepared for government. And um, the general thinking behind bringing Sue Gray in from Keir Starmer was that she would do the government stuff, and Morgan McSweeney, an Irishman, um, um, would do the politics. And 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 that didn't really work out for Starmer, and that all blew up in his face then by October when um, Sue Gray then was sacked. Um, and Morgan McSweeney, a guy from McCroom uh, in Cork, he's lived in London since he was 17, um, comes from a Fine Gael family, um, and he's in his mid-40s now, same age as me, comes from a Fine Gael family, I think, um, I think his aunt is, is a Fine Gael councillor down in McCroom, I think one of his first cousins, I think, was a, a, a special advisor to Leo Varadkar. Um, but he is now at the heart of the, the Downing Street operation. And since October, and it's really noticeable, you really notice this in the Westminster lobby, number 10 Downing Street is a much more political operation than it was uh, before October. Re that's really, really noticeable. Um, and I think the new Morgan McSweeney um, uh, uh, Downing Street um, is being run along three basic principles. Uh, Barry, the first one is that there is now a relentless focus, or there will be, um, a relentless focus on making voters feel better off, the right kind of voters. Um, um, not the voters who will never vote Labour, but the voters, um, uh, they're, they're insanely focused upon people who voted Conservative in 2019, then didn't feel well off and switched to Labour um, um, in the July election just gone. And they're terrified about losing those voters. Um, the second bit is that Morgan McSweeney's always been a very data-driven guy. I mean, before he came into the number 10 operation, he ran Labour Together, um, um, which is a, a kind of a pro Keir Starmer think tank. And he had he had data on everything. Um, and he masterminded Keir Starmer's rise to power, really. Um, and then the third principle of, of, of the Morgan McSweeney Downing Street that is different to the Sue Gray Downing Street is a much, much... Um, better focus on communications and trying to get ahead of stuff. Um, I mean, to give you one example of that, um, um, under under uh, uh, Sue Gray, Downing Street uh, basically uh, allowed 
the Treasury and allowed Rachel Reeves to, to, to implement this policy about winter fuel payments and taking winter fuel payments away from pensioners. I think under a Morgan McSweeney Downing Street, that would never have been allowed to happen um, um, because, uh, uh, you know, just to, to, to update people what happened, um, they basically means test winter fuel payments now um, for, for, for British pensioners. Um, and and I, I think there was this idea that rich pensioners were getting it. But of course, in the minds of British vote, voters, a rich pensioner is somebody who has an income of a hundred grand, not somebody who has an income of eleven grand, um, uh, which which is which is the new threshold. And and I think Morgan McSweeney understands better than Sue Gray that you need to communicate these kind of things better, um, and that there needs to be uh, a, a focus on talking to the electorate uh, in in a way that isn't about deliverology. It's not about it's about having a narrative and a story and a weakness of Keir Starmer that we saw through the election and until now is a kind of an inability, I think, to tell stories. And and he lacks a little bit of emotional intelligence, Keir Starmer, I think, in, in some ways. Maybe that's a bit harsh. He lacks the 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 ability of some of his predecessors like Tony Blair to tell a big story and a big narrative. And he might admit that himself. I mean I've spent a bit of time with Tom Baldwin, um, who is a former Labour Director of Communications, but who wrote um, uh, a very well received biography, a, a kind of a, a friendly biography of Keir Starmer, but a, but a quite well received biography of him, and that was published at the beginning of the year. And he basically said that you know Keir Starmer wakes up in the morning and wonders why he has to talk about his parents to the media, why they're interested in Arsenal, why they're interested in uh, uh, what his kids do and how his wife feels about moving into 10 Downing Street. He hasn't quite copped onto the fact that you need stories and narratives um, um, and, 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 you know, emotional intelligence to deal with a British electorate and that you can't just focus on deliverology, which is delivering data and, uh, and, and results and, 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 and numbers and so on. Um, another thing to, uh, to, to, to talk about with this, with this government is that they are terrified. And this came from, you know, this really stood out in this briefing I had with Jonathan Ashworth earlier in the week. They are terrified of being a one term government um, and it's a real real fear in this government when you look at their, their election victory and we can talk about the election and maybe i'll leave that for questions i'll take questions on, on the election itself but um when when you talk about people in this in, in this government um um you, you know they, they won over 400 seats with barely 35 percent of the vote they actually got a lower share of the vote than jeremy corbyn got in 2017 um, and this is really understood in Labour that was they had this massive victory in seats that is quite brittle in a lot of ways and that they're going to be hit from both sides um, uh, uh, they've got obviously you know the threat from maybe a, 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 the Conservatives might make some sort of a comeback there's also the threat from Nigel Farage's Reform UK who could cause them a lot of trouble in a lot of places and then also the threat from from their own left wing um, um, in the party and and there is a real fear that 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 even though they've got this massive majority, that they could effectively lose out, not by the Tories winning a majority again in 2029, but maybe by some sort of a, 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 a Tory, maybe a coalition with reform or something like that that could overtake them. So, <clears throat> so they're, they're hyper-focused already on the next election. Um, another thing to talk about, um, um, I suppose, a, a real milestone this year for this Labour government, and again, I'm, <clears throat> I'm working slightly backwards here, is, is it's it's... Impossible to overestimate how totemic the budget at the end of October was for this government, how surprising it was, um, and the approach that Rachel Reeves took, the shock almost, um, um, and, and, and how stunned people in Westminster were by the scale of the taxation changes and the tax and spend nature of the budget. I mean, I was sitting in the press gallery of the House of Commons when she announced some of the numbers around um, taxation and so on, and there were literal, literal audible gasps of surprise um, at that budget. And what that budget did was it really laid down a marker. It was a real traditional social democratic budget. Um, and it laid down a marker that this was how Labour was going to govern, that they were going to focus on working people and their standards of living. And and, and I suppose, um, um, you know, it, it was, I think, you know, governments talk, politicians talk about you know, campaigning in 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 pro in poetry and governing in prose, I think um, um, Keir Starmer campaigned by being a friend to business. But once they've gone into power, they've really focused on workers and on voters. Um, and then I suppose really quickly, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring this to a, to a conclusion now in a second. But uh, another thing to talk about is is, is their foreign affairs um, and their approach to foreign affairs. Um, 
I suppose another thing that that you pick up in the lobby is that there's a lot of irritation in Labour at the moment, or there has been until now, about the amount of time Keir Starmer has been spending abroad. Um, they think he's been spending too much time abroad. Um, I, I, in fact, I think they cancelled a trip to New Zealand um, to try and pare back some of his, his foreign engagements. Um, and, um, you know, you can kind of understand why Keir Starmer was doing this. He was trying to reset Um, Britain's damaged image abroad and um, I think he made a good fist of resetting the relationship with Ireland I don't think Britain has made such a good fist of resetting the relationship with the EU and that's something that we can talk about in the questions and, and the question and answer session and and, and, and with myself and yourself and, and with everybody in the call um, so so the, the, the foreign thing I think you're going to see that scale back a little bit more I, 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 another kind of insider's tip I guess is, is, is something that we've noticed over the last couple of weeks is that Morgan McSweeney has effectively fired all of number 10's foreign policy advisors um, and there are actually no official foreign policy advisors left in number 10 as far as i know unless they've appointed one in the last couple of days and um, they have um um, um you know they, 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 they're really running on empty there in foreign affairs and that's because they want to focus on the foreign stuff and i, I don't know barry whether you want to talk myself and yourself about the election campaign now or if you want me to give you a little vignette on that and how the election campaign itself went but um i spent most of the election campaign on the road and um, i think over the course of that six-week campaign it was a long campaign i think i spent about four nights in my own bed here in london and um, i spent most of it running around the country and, and and the one thing that i picked up during that campaign is that you know um, um, the the needs and the wants of voters outside of london are entirely different to the needs and the wants of the voters inside of london and particularly i found up in the northeast of england um, and that's where i think labor um fears losing its majority i think i think the reform party came second to labor in about 72 constituencies right um, and most of those or a lot of those were in the northeast and the midlands of england um, and 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 the reform party and we can talk about this as well they're going to be a real threat to labor um, in the next election not necessarily a threat to, to its position as a government but but certainly to, to sort of the size of its majority um, and so so i noticed that in the election campaign that 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 There was no real warmth I didn't pick up for for Labour in places like Sunderland, um, in Durham, um, in in Hartlepool. They won back Hartlepool, um, 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 but but there was no real, there was no glad tomorrow, no sense of glad tomorrow in these places in the same way that there was in nineteen ninety seven for Tony Blair. So that's something that I think they're conscious of. Look, I'll 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 wrap it up there in terms of my remarks. That's something that I'm that, that I was conscious of that there was no real love for this Labour government. They know that they're terrified about losing the next election, and they fired the starting gun on it already. I think. Thanks a million, Mark. You covered an enormous amount of ground. Loads of really interesting topics. A few of which I might pick apart with you, including. Let's start in a moment by going back to the to the, to the campaign and, and the canvas and what you kind of saw and experienced there. Because I think I would certainly find it very interesting. But I'll just remind those of you who are online, of course, there's a few after coming in. But if you do have any questions for Mark, please do drop them in and I get through as many of them as we can. So so thank you for covering uh, Morgan McSweeney. What a fascinating story. And mm -hmm. I've been aware of the I'm 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 aware of some of the impact he has had, but I didn't realize what you were saying about the foreign policy advisors there's probably a few people on the call who might be might be interested now looking on guardian jobs to see if there's a, an opening for them in westminster because i didn't re didn't realize that was a thing so the, mm. yeah but, but but also like any something i'm really interested in as like intellectual or as academic as it is is, is a, a electoral systems and how they differ and i've worked in both the irish and british systems as i said to you before and just mm. the frailties of the uk system is just so abundantly obvious i think it's something like it was a 1.6 percent swing i think labor got from the previous election mm. 200 extra odd seats the tories lost 20 percent of their vote but still i mean it's it's absolutely what you uh what you say about the kind of um the fear of a one-term Labour government, I can totally get that because it's within the margin of error, basically, that you could easily have if you have a bad election, reform, have a good election, you could really be goosed. Um, and then also what you just said about um, what you were saying there about being out and about in different places. Mm -hmm. When you were during the campaign, did you did you follow any any canvases? Uh, did you just kind of hang out in polling places or how did you actually conduct yourself during the, the campaign? What did you go and see and watch? I, I, I did do I, I, I followed some canvases. Before the election campaign, there was a lot of talk about how Scotland was going to be the key to to a Labour. Yeah, I'll ask you about that in a moment, actually. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, I mean, I spent I spent quite a bit of time. So I spent quite a bit of time in the election campaign up in Scotland, particularly along the Central Belt, which runs um, from Edinburgh to Glasgow. 
which was where Labour was trying to win back all of these SNP seats. And we can talk about Scotland more, um, you know, you know, if you, if you put other questions on it. But but I, I spent a little bit of time on the canvas there um, um, with uh, a guy, God, his name, his first name was Greg. I've got his, his, his second name has gone out of my head. Uh, and he's, he, he won anyway. He won a seat back um, um, in, uh, in, 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 in that central belt area. Um, it was around Livingston. It was a seat for whoever is the, the MP for Livingston. If somebody was Greg McClement. I literally just Googled it. Was it Greg McClement? No. Uh, his first time Anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. carry on. So, 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 we spent a bit of time with him, and um, and and you know, uh, uh, Labour was getting uh, not not enormous warmth on the doors, but there was a certain dynamic up in Scotland where people are just sick of the SNP, and, and I mean they've been in power up there for so long, and um, since two thousand and seven, seventeen years, um, and you know you had all of the Nicola Sturgeon scandals and 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 and, and motorhomes and and all of that, and um, so people gave. Labour a cautious welcome back um, in, in, in Scotland. I spent a bit of time in the northeast of England and that was, for me, that was the most profound part of the election campaign um, because, uh, again, a lot of people who, who you, you know, Irish people think they know Britain so well, right, um, because maybe we follow British football team, I follow Man United, and maybe they watch EastEnders, maybe we have some relatives here, you come over a couple of times a year and you think you know Britain, but, but until you go to the depths of places like Sunderland, you don't really know England at least I, 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 I have to say, you see a level of poverty in those areas, obvious poverty and deprivation that I think you would struggle to find its equal in Ireland. Um, and that was something that really stood out for me during the election campaign. And and so there was a there was a cynicism I thought towards Labour up in the northeast of England, and um, maybe a bit of an aftertaste from the Brexit vote. A lot of these areas obviously had voted for Brexit, and a bit of suspicion around how Labour would treat Brexit. But I think in areas like the northeast of England and the south of Wales, where I where I spent a bit of time as well. This will be, I think, the battleground in future between Labour and Reform UK. And, and those are the two areas that, that Reform are targeting now. Um, they are targeting um, the North East of England and, and most of all, South Wales, which, I, which is a, a ph phenomenon all of its own that I find very interesting that they're targeting South Wales. And, 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 and I've spoken to Nigel Farage about this. Um, and I've had lunch with him. I've, I've, I've sat down with him a couple of times. Um, and, uh, and they're targeting South Wales because... There are first of all, I think the demographic suit. You're in these kind of um, post mining and um, deprived areas and um, um, very Brexity areas, um, but also because you've got a proportional representation system of voting in Wales, and there's voting for the Senate in 2026, and they think they can make inroads there. And um, so, sorry, I know you asked me about the campaign, and 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 and, and did I get out and about on the canvas? Um, and I did. I went to I went to quite a few official events at the very start of the campaign and at the very end of the campaign. In the middle, I kind of went my own way. And, um, you know, you notice in these campaigns, they're, they're sort of organised within an inch of your life. Um, and Labour was highly, highly drilled on these on these campaigns. I think, again, Morgan McSweeney was the guy who really ran, uh, in a lot of ways, the, the campaign and planned for it. Um, and they, they were really well drilled and much better drilled than the Tories were. I mean, everybody remembers Rishi Sunak calling the election in the pouring rain and, you know, not coming back for D-Day and so on. It was a very, very well run, very efficient, but... I would say a slightly, almost a slightly joyless Labour campaign in a way. Um, um, it wasn't like 1997 at all. And I mean, I remember 1997 well. It was a year I did my leaving, sir. To you know, so it stands out in a lot of ways. It was a, it was a, it, it was a year I really started to look at politics, and 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 there was just no sense during the election campaign anywhere in Britain of this great welcome for Keir Starmer as an individual. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's a weakness of his or whether it's something he'll make the best of. Um, Tom Baldwin, his biography, talks about how Keir Starmer's approach to politics, certainly when he was leader of the opposition, um, it was as if he was walking through a minefield. And, and if you can imagine somebody walking through a minefield, you don't just trudge across it with this great sense of direction and, and, and purpose. You might go take two steps forward, two steps to the side, one step back, skip over something, jump. It looks messy and um, um, it looks inelegant, um, um, but it's the best way of getting to the other side. And when he was leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer knew how to get to the other side. The other side was Downing Street. That's where he knew he needed to get. But once he got into government, I'm not sure he quite understands yet what the other side is. And that's what he spent time trying to get his head around. Where am I trying to go? I mean, he made a very bad start, Keir Starmer, as leader of the Labour Party when he was appointed uh, in 2020, right up until deep into 2021, when they lost that Hartlepool by-election and he thought about quitting. 
Um, and then he turned it around. And I think within the, the mass ranks of Labour MPs, um, and, and most of them new MPs, um, and they believe, they really do believe that Keir Starmer will turn it around um, and that he, his dogged kind of technocratic problem solving move the rocks out of my way over time approach um, and will 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 bring labor a new election victory and 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 we we'll see that you know but the, the the campaign itself was interesting the glitz and the glamour of course in the organized events but but really what i noticed was the lack of love for labor uh, in the uh, uh, at the doorsteps you know really 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 interesting i, I wonder just from a, a, again a quick google was it gregor pointon The it was Greg Pointon. That was it. A uh, uh, bearded Livingston. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Greg Pointon, uh, uh, who, who I believe used to work for, uh, for Barack Obama once upon a time, or at least yeah. that's what he told me. That's what he told me when we were walking for, for, for a firm that advised Barack Obama, I think more, more accurately. He told me that as we were walking around the doorsteps, but yeah, Greg, Greg Pointon. Yeah. Congratulations on your election, Greg. The, um, just have two or three thoughts to share and then we can get into some more questions that I'm, I'm really, really with you on what you said about kind of, Knowing England and Wales, I mean, it, it's self-evident in in any mm. country, not just in England, but like once you, once you get out of the the main centres of, of 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 commerce or or of politics, you really get to see a different side. I'm a fan of Shane Meadows, the filmmaker, and he depicts England in the 80s and 90s in a way that's really vivid. And Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire and these parts of the world. Um, so it's really, I think it's really cool to have had that experience to go to the. Were, were you were you at any of the counts outside of London, or did you have to come back and write up your stuff, or did you get to go to a sports um, hall, um, Essex, or anything? Uh -huh. I, I didn't go to any of the count halls. What I did was I went to, um, uh, uh, they call it the the, the unofficial official um, um, and watch party. They all have their watch parties mm -hmm. here for the election where they all stand around. And I went to one which is organised by a company called Lodestone Communications, um, which is a labour-focused PR company, I guess, communications company. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the official event, event watch party was in the Tate. And even most labour staff couldn't get tickets for that. Um, for example, all of Angela Rayner's staff percent of the one that I was at um, um, and I observed that on election night and you know I think when you're writing about politics and maybe when you're observing as an outsider or maybe when you're writing about it academically or journalistically you forget how involved these people are how much of a part of their lives it is um, and, and whereas for us we're observing it almost from a neutral point of view when 10 o'clock came and when that um, uh, exit poll was about to drop. Uh, they dropped a big, there was a big screen at this watch party that I was at. And I watched all of the Labour people. I watched Tom Watson and um, um, I watched um, uh, 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 Lord Southwark, um, Roy Kennedy, uh, other people. They all moved apart from each other on, on uh, uh, to watch it on their own. It was a, almost a spiritual moment for them, a personal moment where they wanted to watch this exit poll drop on their own and um, without talking to anybody else. And I understood then in that moment that, you know, politics is really personal for these people. It's really a part of their lives. And, and as a journalist, you know, as a kind of a scrappy outsider criticizing everybody, you don't sometimes realize how emotionally invested these people are. And after a couple of minutes, when they realized that they had won 400 and something seats, and um, they all coalesced back in groups and um, to chat about it. But just for that moment, they all they all separated. And I found that a very, very interesting moment to observe as an outsider, you know. Sounds amazing. And it's the, um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I, I, I've i lived that. I'm totally, totally uh, kind of uh, enthralled to what you're saying. But I, at the same time, I, I'm thinking of something from having, I'll be the first to say that British and Irish culture shares so many similarities and also our political cultures. But having spent time in, in, and, in and around both, the, the electoral system, again, which we've already mentioned, mm -hmm. lends itself to such a different sort of elections. Because exactly. when, when working in, in the UK, so much of the, em of the emphasis on polling day is about kind of getting your vote out or, or mm -hmm. knocking up, trying to get people who've committed to you to show up. Whereas in Ireland, you're still chasing the the twos, the threes and the fours, you know, you're ch chasing your transfers. So if someone isn't going to vote for you, you appeal for their second or third or fourth. And indeed where the Institute is in Dublin Central, we saw that we saw the the magic of PRS TV playing out of the weekend where Mary Sherlock overtook uh, Jerry Hutch. Mary, Mary Sherlock elected in a four seater alongside Mary Lou, Pascal Donoghue and Gary Gannon. Like, you know, the media types you meant to list off everyone in a constituency, but you really saw yeah. like, just the, the different political vibe. And then in the count centre, again, I've been in both count centres in the UK and in Ireland, like the tallying, the kind of sense of a truce you get in Dublin, in Ireland mm. rather, when the elections are finished, that like, it is a bit more, the winner takes all nature of UK politics just makes it a slightly different uh, experience yeah. than in Ireland. They, 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 they do value that. I have to say, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people uh, in Westminster about the different um, political systems that we have. I mean, they think ours is a bit too 
uncertain and um, 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 you know you know coalitions obviously over here I mean obviously you had the Lib Dem Conservative coalition um, from, from 2010 to 2015 but coalitions aren't the norm obviously over here um, um, they like in their first past the post system the definite result and um, 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 that, that, that it's a decisive move that the country can take a decisive direction but of course you know it has all of these um, weird anomalies like for example if you look at Reform UK's vote versus the Lib Dems vote, right? Um, Reform UK got more votes than the Liberal Democrats. Reform UK won five seats, the Liberal Democrats won 72. Now, that is an enormous difference and you really have to question whether or not that is fair. But look, you have to play the game by the rules which are laid down um, and everybody plays the game on the same rules. And maybe if Labour had been fighting an election under our system, maybe they would have won um, a higher share of the vote. Maybe they would have fought the campaign slightly differently. But under... Morgan McSweeney in particular, um, there was this relentless focus on, on, on voters who matter, not just any old voter, but the voters who will vote Labour. Like, for example, again, you see, you see, you saw a hit of this in the last couple of weeks in the way Labour was prepared to jack up inheritance tax on farms, right? Mm -hmm. Labour has oh, made, yeah. Labour has made a, a kind of a, a, a judgment that these kind of um, welly wearing, wax jacket wearing kind of um, toffs in their eyes to, to, to a lot of lame people will never vote for them anyway. Um, um, and that and that this whole, you know, this whole inheritance tax loophole on farms was being used by big landowners and people who were really hobby farmers to, uh, to stash their capital. And, um, um, you know, they don't mind taking the media hits on that. They don't mind the protests, the farmers and the wellies up in Parliament Square because they think these people aren't going to vote for them anyway. And I think that's really a, a Morgan McSweeney driven approach. Morgan McSweeney is Keir Starmer's politics brain. And I think that's the best way of looking at it. Keir Starmer is a technocrat. He doesn't have the big uh, emotionally intelligent Tony Blairite kind of approach. He also doesn't have really the, the knowledge of the Labour Party. I mean, he's only an MP since 2015. Um, um, and, and, and Morgan McSweeney is, he's become so reliant on him, I think, um, that, 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 that the two are almost indivisible at this stage, you know. Really interesting, Mark. I, I could keep keep chatting to you and I'll have a chance to, I guess, put in a few more questions myself. But we're going to go to the Q&A in a moment. I want to ask you one more thing. It's a two part question just before we dip into the the audience questions. Just looking away from the Labour Party, new leadership in the Tory party under Kemi mm -hmm. Badenoch. Mm -hmm. Already mentioned the Tories actually over the course of the past 35 minutes or so, which is interesting. And then you've also mentioned reform. Do you have anything mm. to say just about the performance specifically of those two parties? You can mention any of the others as well if you think there's anything interesting to say, but especially the Tories and reform since the election. Anything of interest you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah. Well, well just uh, well, I, maybe I probably already mentioned it already, but but reform, I think, will be one to watch over the next couple of years. And and, and there'll be one to watch in the Senate elections in, uh, in, 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 in Wales in 2026, where they're really targeting. Reform launched their 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 campaign for the entire UK general election in July. They launched it actually in Merthyr Tidville in Wales, which was a signal of intent. Um, and, and also, um, when you talk to people up in Scotland, um, um, under current polling, um, there'll be elections for Holyrood as well in uh, in, in May 2026. Um, uh, reform are on track on, under current polling with no campaigning or anything to take about eight or nine seats in, uh, in Scotland under the list system. So you've got this uh, interesting phenomenon of this essentially an English nationalist party, um, which is on course to have quite a, 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 a reasonable presence in Scotland and potentially a significant presence in, in Wales, which is, Wales is effectively a one party state, right? Um, 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 a Labour state. Um, so, so, so reform are one to watch there. In, just in terms of reform, obviously, they've had their own problems. Um, there's been a little bit of a power struggle inside reform since Nigel Farage came back. Um, I, I, I started having a glass. At the very start of the election campaign, I was at an event in London and I stood about 18 inches from Nigel Farage, looked him in the eye and asked him, are you going to run in the election? And he looked me back in the eye and he swirled his glass of wine and he told me he wasn't. Um, and 36 hours later, he uh, he jumped into the campaign. Um, and and since, he, since he came back into, the in, in, into reform as leader, there's been a little bit... There's a guy called Ben Habib. I don't know if you if, if you know if you've come across him. But Ben Habib was the deputy leader of the Reform Party, but he had set up this um, alliance between uh, 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 the Reform Party and the TUV in Northern Ireland, which is Jim Alistair's party. Um, and uh, and 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 Ben Habib was basically ousted when when uh, when 
uh, Nigel Farage came back and Nigel Farage decided to back um, uh, to, to endorse his DUP friend, Sammy Wilson, who got back in uh, and, uh, and Ian Paisley Jr., who didn't. Um, and that caused a big rupture. So reform has been trying to professionalise itself. Um, I was at the reform conference up in Birmingham um, in September, the annual conference, and it was noticeable how how... Um, more professional it was than other reform events I had been at. Some of the reform events I was at um, during in the early summer, for example, before the election campaign was called, were quite earthy um, and they kind of got off on having this um, um, kind of grassroots approach, um, very informal, lots of cursing and swearing and swilling beer at these events. And, um, and But at the, at the campaign in, or at the, the conference in, in Birmingham, it was much different. Reform sees itself um um i think uh as 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 a party that could win a very very large amount of seats at the next election and i think i think a lot of the the dynamics are actually in their favor to do that um and um, obviously they need probably proportional representation to be brought in in britain to have a chance really of 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 getting into government because it, i think it would be difficult to see the tories um doing a deal with them you asked then about the tories themselves um at the Tory conference um, in in um, in September um, um, late September start of October, um, which was in uh, the Tory conference again was in uh, Manchester I think again wasn't it? Um, uh, it was it was noticeable how. Um, there was a sense of relief, I think, about the Tory party. A, a, a little bit like people who knew your beating was coming. And once you take that beating, there's almost a relief rally at the end of it. And um, you know that the worst has happened. Um, um, I thought there was a lot of optimism in the Tory party, strangely enough, when I was at that conference um, at the start of October. The leadership contest at the time was was underway and um, it looked during that conference like James Cleverly were starting to eke into the lead. Um, James Cleverly was the one, the former Home Secretary, former Foreign Secretary as well. He was the one that Labour feared, if that's the right word. Certainly that the, Labour saw him as a serious politician. He was the one that Labour didn't want to win the Tory leadership contest. Um, and um, they didn't really mind Robert Jenrick winning um, or Kemi Badenoch because I think Labour thinks that Kemi Badenoch um, will get into a fight in a phone box and that she won't end this drama, drama, drama kind of atmosphere around the Tory party. But the Tories and um, the Conservative Party, they seem to believe that Kemi Badenoch um, will absolutely batter Keir Starmer every Wednesday at noon at PMQs. Um, and I think that's where they see it. So just with those two parties, um, 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 I suppose that's just a vignette in those. And maybe look, just look on the Liberal Democrats who've had their best result ever. Um, spent a bit of time with Ed Davey. I, I, I sat on a lakeside up in, um, up in the Cotswolds and watched them being pulled around by a speedboat in, uh, in, a, in an inflatable or something. Oh, you were there for that, were you? I, I, well, well, he did that pretty much every day, Barry. Um, and this, 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 this was how we spent the election campaign. You know, but look, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now and uh, and, and leave time for questions. No, it's, but... look, it's it, it's absolutely brilliant. But you're right. I've been indulging myself, and there's there's a couple of questions after 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 coming in, which which we should probably turn to. But I certainly um I could see about Kemi and uh, and the Prime Minister at at, uh, at Prime Minister's questions on a Wednesday. That could be real ding dong stuff. I'm going to um. Turn to, to Paul Gillespie. How are you, Paul? Good to have you. So, Paul, formerly of your of your parish in the Irish Times and um, still a correspondent and also at UCD, active member of the Institute here. Paul asks, how much focus do Labour have on constitutional futures, preserving the union, placating Scotland, which you mentioned briefly, but would be good to hear more on, and tackling regional inequalities? Do Labour have the financial capacity to deliver the transactional resources and politics needed for that? Any thoughts? Um, well, just in, in, in terms of the focus on, on, on the regions, one of Sue Gray's successes before she was unceremoniously chucked out was that she had built up a really good relationship between Labour HQ and the devolved regions, um, like Andy Burnham and Manchester um, and, and the devolved governments. And, and Labour really saw the, the, the system of devolution as being this system of pipes that they could that they could get a lot of pour resources down and get a lot of stuff done really, really quickly. Um, and, and it was kind of Sue Gray's achievement was to was to improve relations between um, um, all of the devolved leaders and 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 Keir Starmer and HQ, which had been kind of sketchy um, 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 until she came along. Um, 
So, um, uh, sorry, I, I, I forget all of Paul's question, but but just to, yeah, I, I, I know he mentioned Scotland in it. Scotland has been a, a relentless focus of Labour's politically. Um, you know, it turns out they didn't need the Scottish votes in the end, the Scottish seats in the end to win a majority. Their, their numbers are so high anyway. But there is... Um, um, they, they never showed up talking about it, basically, uh, in, in Westminster. Um, and there's a relentless focus on, 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 on bringing Anna Sarwar, who was the Scottish Labour leader, um, um, into the centre of the conversation at any point. Um, I mean, in Rachel Reeves' budget, she gave an extra, I think it was £3.4 billion pounds, um, under the Barnet formula to Scotland um, to spend on its public services. Actually, Scotland announced her draft budget yesterday, actually. Um, um, so, so they have poured resources at Scotland in that sense. Um, 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 they would like um I think I think Labour is looking ahead to the to the Hollywood elections in 2026 when they would like to topple um the SNP and take control of 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 of, of the Labour haven't been in government in Scotland since um and are certainly not on their own since before 2007. And um, so they really think that they're due a turn up there and um uh, uh yes I, I think yes that th they're certainly going to direct resources at scotland they've already given that initial 3.4 uh, billion pounds and um, they have um uh, uh, you know for example gb energy um, and which is one of their big wheezes and um, they based that on aberdeen although where else would you base it i guess only 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 on the north sea so scotland is a big focus there's wales is a slightly different one um, um in terms of the regions um you know there's been another change of first minister there and um, ellen Ed morgan is in there now and um, mark drakeford has gone and there was a period of 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 tumult between mark drakeford and uh and and and, and ellen morgan and um, 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 uh, so so there was there, there was a lot of a lot of political upheaval um it it, it i i don't think this labor government is a uh, has is as prepared or as planned for what to do in Wales as it is in Scotland. I mean, from a Westminster perspective, do you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, it's a, Wales is has had a Labour government for 25, 26 years um, and since the dawn of, 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 of devolution. Um, but at a Westminster level, there's a much greater Labour focus on Scotland than there is on uh, on, on Wales. Then on, on, on the other devolved regions in England, <clears throat> the, the metropolitan areas um, and, you know, Manchester and Liverpool and whatever. Um, yes, I think they are going to give those areas resources for stuff like um, buses. I mean, a lot of these areas have, have, have money now. To, they're, they're sort of almost they're bringing a lot of their bus systems back into um, back into a, 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 a city control. Um, and, and, and there's going to be funds for that. Um, so, look, devolution is, is, is a system that Labour sees as a a convenient distribution network um, for resources, a much more efficient distri distribution network, a kind of a decentralization of financial power almost in a sense. And we saw the signals of that in the budget when 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 Rachel Reeves set out um, 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 um the extra money that she was going to give to Scotland under the Barna formula, you know. And actually I might stay with that for a little bit. I propose mm -hmm. the time we have remaining uh, Mark, I'll put a couple of thoughts to you that are of a domestic nature domestic pertaining to the UK and then predictably with the audience we have here at the Institute there's a couple of questions regarding foreign policy in the UK mm -hmm. the rest of the world but I have a tab open somewhere on my computer here it's a House of Commons library paper on why it's why why are all the local authorities going broke or why are all the local authorities going bankrupt I think it's called which is a very kind of blunt title for what is a, a usually staid enough kind of uh, producer of very good um, research and reports do you, do you follow that to any extent? Why you know large local authorities are running back? You know, like being an election year, most of my focus has been on Westminster. But but yeah, I mean, look, look. Obviously, there's a trend. I mean, Birmingham, I think, was the most notorious one. A lot of these uh, local authorities, um, you know, some of them they can issue their own bonds to a certain extent. Um, and they do have some certain revenue raising capacities. And um, <laughs> look, look, there, there, there just was, there just hasn't been great control um, and, and, and oversight from a Western perspective of those. So look, I, I suppose it raises an interesting question that if a lot of these local authorities and particularly in metropolitan areas like, 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 like Birmingham and so on, if, 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 if the actual local authorities, labor run local authorities haven't, haven't um, managed their finances so well, why pour extra resources into into devolution in these areas? You know, have they shown that they can't spend this the money so wisely? Look, I don't know, and um, and time will tell on that. Um, but but yeah, no, it is interesting that this 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 phenomenon. You know, the Tories try and paint it that that it's just Labour councils that are going bust. I don't think that's entirely true. I think I some of the ones, 
I, 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 I think some of the ones that were Tory controlled have also gotten into problems. Um, but you know, you know, outside of London, which has its own economy, obviously, and and in the Midlands and the Northeast and other areas, I mean, you know, the economy in a lot of these areas is really moribund. You know, I mean, there, 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 there really are no um, um or few avenues for growth. Um, um so um, um, this is something again that the Labour government is going to have to focus on over the next while. You know, is driving growth and 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 not just abstract growth, but growth that people feel uh, in their pockets and that they feel in their standard of living. I think a lesson that, that this Labour government, by the way, has learned from the Biden campaign, the failed Biden campaign in the US, is that it's no good being the fastest growing economy and telling people that if they don't feel um, better off, it doesn't matter what a GDP, GDP figures are abstract. These people don't care about GDP. What they care about is their own pockets, and um, particularly outside of London, um, and where people's pockets have felt um, like they've had holes in them for years. It's um, one of the iron laws of, of politics, I think, isn't it? The James Carville thing about it being the economy. Staying within the the borders of the, of, of the UK, there, there's a question from Emma Richardson, who who is a researcher here at the Institute. Hello, Emma. Emma asks, as I think a lot of people, including myself, are wondering if you have anything to say on, how do you think Northern Ireland features in the broader context of British politics today, both in terms of public opinion across Britain and its influence on key national issues such as governance, Brexit and Labour's overall vision for the union. I'll just give a, a, a tiny kind of addition to that. I remember working in and out of Westminster and London for a long time, and I'll be the first person to kind of um, speak up for life in the UK. I had a great time there and, you know, lots of great people with interest in Ireland. But the number of times I was stopped in my tracks, stunned by some kind of astounding level of ignorance that someone who ought to know better about the constitutional nature of these islands Happen, happen more than a couple of times, you know. So I'm always very interested to, to, to consider Emma's question there. What role do you think Northern Ireland today is playing in kind of the political um, moment in the UK, but also more generally, given your, your travels across the country? Um, not a lot, to, to, to be honest. I mean, look, you know, Keir, Starmer, Keir Starmer has done quite a good job of resetting relations with the Republic, with, with, with Ireland and, and with, with smoothing things over in the north. I mean, look, he understands Northern Ireland. I mean, he, he, he worked there for, um, I think, about, about five years as a, as a human rights advisor to, um, to, the, to, the, to when they were setting up um, the PSNI. Um, and so he understands the dynamics there. Um, um, but I think for the ordinary British or English um, voter uh, and, and, and political system generally, there's not a lot of interest in Northern Ireland at the moment. There was only interest in insofar as it w w was a part of the Brexit debate. I, I remember, I think it was earlier this year, sitting down and having a, a, a cup of tea with John Alderdice, um, 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 who was who was over in Westminster, obviously he's a member of the House of Lords. Uh, and, um, and, and he told me that, that as far as he was concerned, the emotional connection between British people and specifically English people and Northern Ireland was completely absent. He thought it was completely broken. He thought that there was no. He said that in his estimation that 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 most English people couldn't give a hoot if Northern Ireland um, um sailed off into the sunset tomorrow. Now, obviously, it's different at a political level. Um, 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 um you know, Keir Starmer understands that. Um, um, I think I think when when Northern Ireland isn't in the news. Um, um, I, I, I think in Westminster they don't really think about it at all um, and I, I think that's probably the best way to look at it and, and just going back to something in, 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 um, in, in, in Paul Gillespie's um, question he, I think he mentioned as well you know the constitutional position I, I mean I know I know that Gordon Brown obviously had had, had, had before the election drafted this big plan for how to use devolution and, and you know devolution max and how to how to absolutely absolutely maximize de devolution on the constitutional issue with Northern Ireland. One thing that I've noticed is that Keir Starmer has changed his tune um, between what he said before the election and what he says now. Um, and before the election, Keir Starmer made a point of um, specifically saying that he would campaign, if there was a referendum for United Ireland, that he would campaign for it to remain in the union, that he saw himself as a unionist. Um, that was a political gambit, I think, because um, for two reasons. Number one, he was afraid that if he looked weak on the union in terms of Northern Ireland, that he'd be torn apart by the SNP in Scotland. Um, um, and number two, um, he was trying to appeal to all of these brexit -y voters, these kind of white van man up in Sunderland and, and, and in the northeast of England who had actually voted for Boris Johnson's Tory party in 2019. And they were trying to tempt all these guys back. I mean, if you notice, you know, for example, during the election campaign, for example, um, 
the St. George's flag for England was everywhere all over Labour's campaign. The Union Jack was everywhere. And there was a time maybe under Jeremy Corbyn when the Union Jack and specifically the St. George's flag, I mean, it would have been like, you know, for a lot of Corbynites, it would have been like hanging a Nazi symbol um, um, at a party rally. They, they, they ran a million miles through it. Labour embraced all of that. They embraced Englishness. They embraced the St. George's flag. They embraced the Union Jack. And in the midst of all of that, Keir Starmer um, um, embraced a kind of a, um, a pro-Union um, um, uh, 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 position on Northern Ireland that 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 was really very careful and and conservative and it was all about not opening himself up to criticism. Since he's become prime minister, I think he's been a little bit more nuanced on that. Um, um, I think he 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 understands the concerns of nas of nationalists um, and of republicans, um, and he's quite well disposed to them. He doesn't talk now about he doesn't certainly doesn't make any play about um, um, how much of a unionist he is and how much he would campaign for uh, uh, for Northern Ireland or main part of the UK if there was a referendum. And that's you know that's I just noticed that there's a subtle difference on that um, um, in terms of Northern Ireland, the, the sort of pre-election cursed armour and the post-election cursed armour. That's really interesting as ever, uh, Mark. J just before turning to maybe a, a final volley of questions about uh, foreign policy, is there anything about the current clutch of, of Northern Irish MPs, the ones who show up, do they have much of a profile or are any of them kind of turning your head in any way? Um, of, the, of the Northern Ireland MPs, um, well, I, I mean... Look, I, I suppose you could you could say um, you could say Jim Allister. Um, Jim Allister has a a, a, a private members um, bill. Um, um, you know, it's related to 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 the to the the the, the Brexit deal and, and and so on. I think that's actually being debated today. No, tomorrow I think. Um, 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 tomorrow's Friday, right? I think that's I think that's actually due to be debated in Parliament tomorrow. He's the, the first private members bill on the list was last week's assisted dying one. The second one was is um, is Jim Allister's bill. Now, look, I think there. He's a little bit worried about whether or not anyone would show up for it. I, I, I think it would be a bit much to say Jim Allister has stood out. Um, um, I remember during the uh, um, when the new speaker was being sworn in. I remember sitting in the House of Commons when it's traditional for all the leaders of all the parties to stand up and say something, and you're supposed to say something nice and friendly, and um, basically. And and as the leader of the TUV, Jim Allister stood up and said something really divisive and um, and not very gracious. And there was this groan around the House of Commons, and I thought, God, this guy's got to slip off into the ditch now and no one's going to want to hear from him. but he's actually been quite active about the place um, and he's actually hired um, as, a, as, a, as an advisor a guy called Gawain Towler um, who used to work for Nigel Farage until he was sacked a couple of weeks ago by the new chairperson of the Reform Party so um, that, there's been a bit of mending of fences anyway that's an aside but there's mm -hmm. been a mending of fences between the TUV and and, uh, and, oh, of and, course. Reform, yeah, of course. and, and, and Reform other, other, other ones that have stood out I think it, It'll be interesting to see what Colm Eastwood does now that he is no longer the leader of the SDLP and he doesn't have the burden of running the party. Um, um, I think I think he was quite satisfied to hand over um, um, the leadership of the SDLP to Claire Hanna um, and, 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 and go back to being a constituency MP. Um, you know, he's an interesting voice. He's very, very articulate, Colm Eastwood. Um, and whenever he makes speeches, people tend... Um, to listen because he's such a good deliverer of a speech and um, you know when when in such contrast to Jim Alster when 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 in when the speaker was being elected when when um, at, at the start of the new parliament and Jim Alster made that speech that went down like a lead balloon Paul Eastwood made one of the funniest speeches I've ever heard in in, in the House of Commons and um, um, so it'll be interesting to see um, how he gets on without the burden of leadership um, um, of the party yeah. I mean, they're two objectively very talented politicians, the two people you just mentioned, and they do have, there's a track record of not just SDLP uh, MPs, but certainly SDLP MPs having a, an outsider, outsized role in Westminster and, and being, I think even Mark Durkin won the kind of the, the humorous MP award a couple of times, whatever it's called. They are, they're kind of good for those sorts of set pieces. Yeah. Let's move to maybe the final piece, Mark, that... There's a question I'll put to you. It's from an attendee. It's rather specific. And I'll maybe add a slightly more general um, question to it. And then it'll give you the chance to, if you have anything to say about these questions, great. And then just to wrap up any any final thoughts you have. We've obviously only scratched the surface. Loads of things you could have mentioned and rabbit holes you could have fallen down. So thanks a million for covering such a wide variety of things. Liam Roach asks, uh, how are you, Liam? Good to have you here. Is it likely that the often heralded veterinary agreement between the UK and the EU will actually happen it seems this may be the extent of Labour's ambition for relations with EU 
and even this may not happen. And just in addition to that, Mark, if you've anything to say that hasn't been said yet about Labour's relations with the European Union five years on from, from the UK's departure and indeed with the US maybe since the um, recent election there, just Labour's place in the world and how it views itself in terms of its foreign policy. Any thoughts? Um, well, look, if if Labour wants a veterinary agreement, it's going to have to give something in return, right? And 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 they still haven't really showed their hands about about what they're willing to give in in return. And um, I I think when you talk to a lot of European Union ambassadors in London, there is almost universal consternation amongst them about what does this Labour government have against Erasmus, right? You know the the the, the student scheme and and. What I think if Labour wants a, a veterinary agreement, it's going to have to give something on that um, and it's going to have to include some sort of... The Europeans want an Erasmus, some sort of a scheme for their young people to come to London, um, come to anywhere in Britain, but principally London, and, and, and spend a bit of time here and have British students uh, go abroad. They want a replacement for Erasmus. They want some sort of a young person scheme and Labour are absolutely terrified of it. And I, I actually asked um, Jonathan Ashworth about this on... Um, Monday, I think it was Monday when we sat down, um, and he said, "Look, there is there is a fear in Labour of saying or doing anything that looks like we're rowing back on our pledge that freedom of movement would never come back." Um, um, so, so to answer Liam's question, do I think they'll get it? I think, I think eventually they will get something from um, in terms of a cytosanitary agreement from the European Union, but I think they're going to have to give something on Erasmus and on student free movement of students and, and, and you know, one year visas for students, work study stuff. They're going to have to give something on that. Just as a wider general point then in relation to the EU, I don't think they've made really that great of a fist yet of resetting relations with the European Union. They've talked a lot, but they haven't showed their hand yet on what they're prepared to offer. I mean, I know in, 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 in addition to a veterinary agreement, what they really would like is some sort of an agreement that benefits the City of London as well. And I know I know Rachel Rees is under a lot of pressure from people in the City of London to get some sort of a a, a, a deal there um, around you know mutual recognition of qualifications and 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 and, and just 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 a, a deal to benefit the city. Um, and again Labour are going to have to hitch their skirt a little bit there and show, you know, show a little bit of ankle about, about what they're prepared to offer the European Union in return. And so far they haven't done that. And I think that's led to a little bit of frustration amongst EU ambassadors in, in, in London that, um, you know, if Labour keeps saying it wants a better relationship with Europe, it keeps saying that, um, and, you know, it wants economic growth and, and that, you know, we can help with economic growth, but they won't tell us what they're going to give us in return. And and that that might be something that that Keir Starmer and I think David Lamy as well um, turned their attention to. A complicating factor, of course, in all of that, and it's a very big complicating factor um, in the shape of Donald Trump in the United States. Um, um, I think they're going to wait and see how relations pair out first between themselves and the US before they really get their teeth into the European relationship. Britain has always, I think, and again, this is something that Jonathan Ashworth mentioned on Monday, Britain has always viewed itself, at least, whether it's viewed externally or not, like this, I don't know, but it's viewed itself as a kind of a bridge between um, Washington and, and, and Europe, um, 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 a kind of a translator, a political translator. And I think they really covet taking up that role again. They've put a lot of effort um, um, David Lamy in particular has put a lot of effort into 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 the US and trying to trying to have good relations there, and they think they've cracked it. They 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 think they've got good relations with the Trump administration, and and through that maybe that will refract into the relationship with Europe. I think. Mark, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, and I can only hope we can continue continue the conversations next time you're back in Dublin or, or online again. But it's been really. Uh, marvellous exposition of uh, a whole lot of politics in a relatively short space of time politics and other things indeed so thanks a million for your time uh keep up the good work and the corresponding and indeed thanks to those at home as well who who joined and indeed those who are listening after the fact many thanks also to emma richardson and my team for pulling things together and welcome Ali for doing the tech and uh, mark thanks a million and we'll see you next time all right thanks barry 